This week on Quality Digest Live, the FDA looks at a third-party program for medical device manufacturers. Plus, SOPs, are they powerful tools or a colossal waste of time? We'll find out when we come back. This week's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is 360 Performance Circle, your destination for today's best training tools. Streaming online now. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for April 25th, 2014. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richman, publisher of Quality Digest. Just back from a trip. Just, just back from a trip. Just right. back. We're going to find out more about that. We'll talk about that in a little just bit. Just flew in, and boy, are you, your arms tired. Boy, boy, <laughs> I, boy, I just flew in, and boy, am I tired of airlines. But we'll <laughs> yeah. find out more about that later. <laughs> I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief, <laughs> Dirk Ducharme. So, you know how I love 3D printing? I, you know, Dirk, you love 3D uh, printing. I love man. 3D printing. Oh, yeah. And you might remember that last year we had an article and a segment on the show about the Irby 2 3D printed car. Well, we came across an announcement from Local Motors, that's a company, that they have launched a 3D printed car design challenge. Contestants submit their car design, keeping in mind that it will be completely 3D printed. And what I mean by that, uh, all the mechanical parts, mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff, not, not the engine, uh, which will be a hybrid, in, uh, I'm sorry, a battery engine, not the wheels, that sort of stuff, but the body itself. Uh, the winner wins $5,000 and their design, the entire car, will be printed at IMTS this year in Chicago. We'll now, be there. that by itself is pretty interesting. What is really interesting is the te technology used to print the car, what little we know of it. The printer uses an additive slash subtractive process. And according to Local Motors, the printer is being developed at Oak Ridge National Labs. And according to 3D Printed Car Challenge website, this machine uses a large diameter extrusion head to 3D print objects at high speed. So that's kind of typical of what we see with mm -hmm. 3D printing, except that the head is larger. But on the same head, it also uses a router to come back and machine surfaces to a more precise specification uh, where, where required. And th this means that they can create car scale forms quickly and freely to a machined precision. So uh, what they're talking about here is you've got uh, you know, your 3D printing, but it's more kind of roughing in the design. It's kind of the way I look at it. And where that rough in is fine, great, but where you need more precise parts, you're coming back and you're routering it. So this is really a different take on 3D printing where what you're printing is what you're going to use. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like this. Uh, one of the interesting design criteria is you must embed the major elements and functions of the exterior, the structure, and the interior in one main printed part. That means essentially the outside, the inside, the dash, the seats, the whole ball of wax is one part. Mm -hmm. Now I think they did say that if you want to have a roof on it, you could make the roof as a separate part and it could be fastened on that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. But basically the entire main structure is one part and that will be printed at IMTS in Chicago. If you're going to be there, I think you will find that pretty interesting. That would be pretty cool. So you can basically, you can basically 3D print a convertible and yeah. print, print the roof later. And print the roof later. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> say, it looks exactly. like it's going to rain. You say, well, let me yeah. print a roof. And, and all they're doing is they, they <laughs> got some constraints, but they've basically said, okay, look, here's the wheels we're mm -hmm. using. Here's the tires we're using. Here's the, you know, the electric engine we're using. Mm -hmm. Here's where they have to go physically in the car. Mm -hmm. So your, your design has to incorporate these in the right place. But other than that, supposedly they're going to print this thing out and slap it on to the rest of it and it'll be a finished car. How cool. Well, yeah, I know. we're going to be out at, at an IMTS in Chicago in September. If you're going to be there too, let's, let's check it out together. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll see what it's all about. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Dirk. Okay. Well, Dirk, as you know, and as we kind of referred to earlier today, just got back from a trip. I uh, visited my parents in Florida. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Happy birthday, Howie. I want to go to Miami. My, my father, Howard Richmond, Howie? turned 80 the other day. And I right. went out there and surprised him in Florida <laughs> for his birthday. That was great. Well, uh, as is normal, I dealt with uh, tight connections 
numerous layovers, delays, cramped seatings, seating, and little in the way of food or drink. In other words, it was a Your typical, typical flight. air travel experience, <laughs> typical air travel experience circa 2014. And it seems that I'm not the only one who thinks that way. The American Customer Satisfaction Index, better known as the AXI, backs up my assertion in its recent Travel Index report, which included analyses of user satisfaction with the airline and hotel sectors. On average, airlines posted a very mediocre 69 score on the Axie's 1 to 100 scale. And, and just in case anyone doesn't know, the, the Axie has a scale where, where they, they, they ask a number of questions of, of customers. They aggregate all that. They crunch it in, in a number of different ways. And they come up with, with an inter, integer, a number that represents customer satisfaction in a particular uh, sector or a sure. particular company. And it's ranked 1 to 100. So the airline industry as a whole had a 69 which is not good, and, and this was unchanged from 2013. It wasn't good in 2013, it hasn't been good for a number <laughs> yeah, of years. Yeah. It's not getting any better. So uh, again, 69 in 2014, 69 in 2013. JetBlue was once again the top airline in the index, although their score slipped from, a, from actually relatively excellent 83 last year to a, score. to a still strong 79 this year. Major carriers such, carriers such as American, US Airways, and United brought up the rear of both years which with scores in the mid to low 60s and and so I can I can uh, kind of full disclosure here I didn't fly any of those airlines <laughs> and yet I still had some problems but it, it was nonetheless it wasn't it wasn't there Titanic it was well it was it was it was, a, it was a, anyway doesn't matter Atlantis I'm not going to get into it right now <laughs> suffice it to say it was frustrating the picture the picture is somewhat brighter for hotel chains which posted an aggregate axis score of 75 this year However, that was down from a 77 in 2013, so there's been a little bit of slippage in the sector as well. The leader was Marriott with a score of 81, just slightly down from its 82 in 2013. Across both sectors, it's notable, I thought it was notable, interesting, that the preliminary experiences were generally looked at more favorably than the actual service itself. In, in other words, elements such as making reservations oh, okay. and checking in, uh, pre-boarding, generally were rated highly, but things like the comfort of seats or beds, uh, in-flight or in-room provisions like food or internet connectivity uh, were more problematic. So I think this shows that these sectors are improving some of the low-hanging fruit in terms of efficiently handling orders as they come in, but in other words, they can take your money faster. They can take your money faster. <laughs> they can get you booked, get you in. That's usually pretty easy. The internet's helped that a lot. But the harder work of increasing the value of the experience itself, which you know is the thing we're actually paying for. Hey, we got your money now. We got your money. Good luck. Good luck. Thanks. Come back. That's still elusive. So anyway, what we're saying here is, is they can do the stuff that's important, most important to them. Again, getting your money, yeah. getting the order. But it's it's harder. It's harder for them to provide for value these good experiences. Uh, just as an aside to this, one of the things that it talked about was this idea that that users are pretty adaptable, customers are pretty adaptable, like things that the airlines have done in particular, like in terms of baggage fees, has had a spillover effect. Now people, of course, bring more carry-ons on, right? So it used to be that you didn't have every single carry-on location was full. Yesterday, on my flight, <laughs> There was like a dozen people that had to have their carry-on checked because yeah. we got in and there wasn't any room in the overhead bins because everybody carries on now. Yeah. Spillover effect. So again, airlines, hotels, I think maybe need to think a little bit more about the actual services <laughs> once the thing, the event actually starts to happen. So for more on this news item and in fact all the pieces that Dirk and I are going to be covering on today's show, just click on the story links right down there below our video player screen as always. Okay. Well, here's a little story on the FDA, what might be happening with the FDA, uh, every two years, I'm not sure if you guys know this, uh, the FDA is supposed to have inspected nearly every medical device manufacturer in the world that sells to the United States. So you, you're a medical device manufacturer, you sell to the United States, you need to be inspected by the FDA. This is a mandate from the government every two years. Well, no big surprise, that just isn't happening. There aren't enough FDA inspectors to do the job. So as Grant Ramaley points out in his article, FDA's discouraging third-party third party MD SAP, in 2012, the FDA's most active inspection year in history, only 5% of overseas manufacturers registered to sell in the U.S. were inspected. That's about a tenth the number of foreign inspections that need to be done, actually mandated to be done, each year. So what to do? Well, the FDA is going to be turning to a new third-party scheme called Medical Device Single Audit Program, or MDSAP. The International Medical Device Regulators Forum began a pilot phase for MDSAP in January. Um, this is an interesting 
type of audit. The audit is constructed to combine as many regulatory audits as the manufacturer would typically face based on the, the countries or the economies it sells to. So to explain this a little bit, uh, you're, you're a medical device uh, manufacturer in France, but you also sell to China, you also sell to Japan. Now, typically what happens is when they're going to sell to J Japan, they have to meet and be audited for some Japan regulatory environment. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, criteria. Same thing with China, same thing for the United States. But the idea was, well, hey, look, we'll just do one audit, and in that audit, you tell us what countries you sell to, and we will incorporate the unique things for each of those countries into this audit. So you get one audit, and you meet the needs of all the countries that, that you sell to. Sounds kind of good, but according to Ramele, the MDSAP's approach of adding the requirements of one regulatory audit to another, instead of having just one set of audit criteria that everybody agrees on, like ISO 13485, that's what it was designed for, this is likely to be the largest and most expensive audit ever imagined. That's uh, Romeli's opinion. Mm -hmm. And it's not likely to get much traction. And here's why, according to Romeli. Uh, a presentation given by Medtronix, medical device manufacturer, to the Asian Harmonization Working Party indicated that MDSAP would likely cost 25% more than any other audit, and that's for millions of dollars for some companies, um, to combine these several different regulatory audits into one and share confidential audit report information among all regulatory members of the IMDRF. Um, this latter, latter bit of sharing of information with foreign regulators is what most likely put the cork in this whole idea, says uh, Ramele. Now, the FDA utilizing voluntary third-party standards to help lessen its, its load isn't a new thing. They've done it before, three times before, says Ramele, and at least and if they failed three times before. And at least with medical device manufacturers outside the U.S., it wasn't very successful. Inside the U.S., on the other hand, it was kind of a different story. Remember, until this point, we've been talking about foreign manufacturers, and we've already said that foreign manufacturers, they don't worry too much about an FDA audit because yeah, they're hardly ever going to get one. Mm -hmm. But large manufacturers in the United States, particularly if they make high-risk products, could get an official FDA audit, maybe, FDA audit maybe every six months. So voluntary standards that let them kind of skip a year, which is what most of these voluntary standards do, they're kind of appealing. So rather than being audited by FDA every six months, they do this voluntary standard, and then I think they get F, uh, they audited by the FDA every two years. Mm -hmm. That obviously sounds like a good idea. And so, so in the past, they have kind of, uh, the large medical device manufacturers in the U.S. have, have said, hey, okay, we can kind of go along with this, saves us some money, saves us some oversight, awesome. Not that, that is not what's going to happen with the MD SAP, with this latest one, according to Romeli. Uh, the, the issue is really just the, the cost issues, uh, as we mentioned before, millions of dollars more, the fundamental complexity of grouping multiple regulatory uh, requirements into one super audit. All of this is just going to make this particular voluntary effort completely uh, unfeasible, mm -hmm. according to Romeli. And, and his frustration, uh, and what he and I have talked offline about is that there's already a system in place to do all this. It's yeah. called one, ISO 13485. It's a common criteria um, uh, that if everybody is, is in on the mutual recognition agreement for this, it's one standard recognized around the world. If everybody would just buy into that, it kind of gets rid of this whole thing. You have one set of criteria which everybody agrees on. Right. And there's no custom standards for one country, another country. Yeah. And that's really the direction we should be going, but uh, there's issues with that, and not everybody seems to get, want to get on board. So. Well, I mean, and the, these individual national things are, are problematic as well because of supply chains. I mean, yes, you know, maybe, maybe a Chinese manufacturer or supplier may not have to worry about the FDA, but certainly a company that uses parts supplied by a Chinese manufacturer has to worry about that. So really the right. Chinese manufacturer should have to worry about it. So as you're saying, I think is ISO 13485 does a better job of covering that maybe than this new this new, yeah, this new yeah program it, exactly and it, like I said the, the, the main thing is that it's it's one set it's it's yeah. one standard and all the signatories have agreed to it yeah. and that's the main thing yeah. is if everybody's agreed to it then that one standard works in all those different countries mm -hmm. um, uh, Romeli is obviously one of the people that is that is pushing for this he's on the uh, the, the uh, oh was it I <laughs> 
Uh, I can't remember the name. There, there's an international, an international organization that tie. Oh gosh, what am I saying here? You've got it in your notes. Uh, I've got you? it in my notes somewhere. Yeah. Because I just talked to him this morning. No, I don't have it in my notes here. But it, but it, it's basically it's, it's, it's an international that, organization. Yeah, yeah the yeah. committee that yeah. is trying to pull all this together. Right. So obviously he's he's got a dog in the show. But yeah. uh, it kind of makes sense if yeah. you listen to all the problems that they're having doing this another way. So well, check out the story. Yeah, again, good story there by Grant Ramallah. We we've run a number of good stories by Grant along these lines. Yeah, he's uh, really plugged into the whole yeah. FDA medical device thing. So. Yeah, so if you're in that sector, definitely check that out. Uh, you can go right below the player page right down there. And, and as always, Eric, as, as you know, as all of us out there know, uh, if you want to say look up Grant Ramallah stories, you can just uh, go to go to uh, search. On content by Grant Romali, uh, Romali, Romali, Romali. Yep. Sorry, Grant. And, uh, and find all the articles. Uh, Grant's written probably a dozen articles yep. for us at this point or, or yep. more uh, on this topic. So check that out. Very good. All right. Well, thanks, Rick. All right. Well, turning now to another feature article that we ran this week that we ran uh, actually in Thursday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. This came from Teresa Tarwater called SOPs, Powerful Tools or Colossal Waste of Time by Teresa Tarwater. There it is right there. And it ran again in Thursday's issue, yesterday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. Well, until I read this piece in this article, I had no idea that standard operating procedures were developed to prevent train wrecks. And I mean that literally. Literally. Yeah. They were literally designed initially by the railroad industry in the late 19th century to help prevent trains from running into each other, to, to coordinate schedules and make sure that switchers and rails and engineers were on the same page and, and were doing things in the same way because there was a lot of, that was a big problem in the 19th century was, was train wrecks. Right. So literally, Standard operating procedures were developed to prevent train wrecks. Interesting little nugget of, of information there. Um, but the question that Teresa dives into in this piece is, is why write SOPs now? There's a lot of people uh, grumble about the task because, of writing SOPs because they say, well, it's taking me away from my real work. The real work that I need to do to stop and to document everything that I need to do and that I do normally, that takes me out of the flow of actually doing the work and it's not value added. Uh, and, and there's a lot of grumbling and pushback uh, against that. Well, uh, Tar Warder suggests in this article that what you can do to combat that a little bit is to assign hard values uh, and improvement targets to that work so that you don't get too focused on the kind of the clerical task of actually writing the SOPs. You get focused on the benefits that you're going to get out of it and what you're looking to achieve by doing that. Um, for instance, SOPs are great at things like quickly training employees, right, or, or you know, new hires. So maybe what you want to do is you can assign a specific target such as, well, we want to train our, our employees in two weeks less time. We want our employees to have two weeks cut off the time in which they're proficient at doing X task, whatever it may be. And we're going to use our SOPs and document the SOPs to do that. Now, management's going to like that a lot more. Management's going to say, well, heck, we saved a lot of money. We got people up to speed much faster. So the investment of doing the SOPs made a lot of sense to do that. Um, you still have to convince the actual people who have sure. to write it. But, <laughs> but certainly if management goes forward and says, hey, yes, take, take some time out of your tasks, do this, we'll allocate the resources to help you do it, it's going to go down a lot better rather than people feel like that it's not value added. Um, I think that, that one of the things that happens here is that, that um, SOPs are, are kind of like standards and that the value of it comes from kind of changing the culture of the organization a little bit. One of the issues that, that SOPs help combat is this idea of, of tribal knowledge. And we all have that, I think many of us have that in organizations where there's knowledge within a tribe of engineers or editors or, or managers or whatever, whatever your tribe is within the organization, you have, you have knowledge that you've accumulated about how to do stuff. And it's kind of ad hoc, it's not really documented really well, it's kind of up there in your brain. And, and you have to go through the, the typical risk management element of saying, well, what if? You know, the, the, of course, the one we always say is, what if you get hit by a bus, right? I mean, if I know how to do a certain task, and I'm really the only one who knows how to do it, no one else is cross-trained in it, uh, and I just do it because I've done it for 20 years, and I'm really good at it, so everybody says, well, let Mike handle that, he'll do it, and nobody ever gets from me, or I never document it myself, well then, if I get hit by a bus, or if another competitor hires me away, or I retire, or whatever happens, I'm not there anymore, well, the organization is going to be stuck. I mean, what happens with tribal knowledge, as we know this happens, is that you develop, you redevelop it. I mean, somebody else, a junior person who's maybe on my team if I was doing that and I leave, they've observed me. They say, yeah, you know, Mike used to do this and I think he did that. And maybe they figure out their own way of doing it after some time. 
And eventually, you know, the organization is going to grind forward and maybe they'll do it better, right? Maybe right. they'll come up with a better way of doing it than the way that Mike did it, that I did it 20 years ago. But maybe not. And, and you don't know. The problem is you don't have the baseline. If you don't have the SOP in place, and that's, again, what Teresa Tarward is arguing in this piece. If you don't have the SOPs in place, you don't have the culture where you're going to document, 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 and have everybody in your org or the key people in your organization understand what you're doing, well, you're going to lose it. You're going to lose that information. The tribal knowledge is eventually going to go away one way or another. People retire, uh, and we see this especially, I think, in metrology, where you have people that are, are trained in doing a certain task, which is a, a, a high-level precision task in terms of, of capturing data or whatever it may be, and maybe nobody else knows how to do that in the organization, and these people are retiring, and there aren't a lot of people coming in. So in that case, SOPs are absolutely critical. You need right. to have it documented. You need to understand what those person is doing and document it to the, to the nth degree if you can because, yeah, again, you don't know what's going to happen. And People it needs to be leave. documented by the person who's actually doing who's it. Who's doing it. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know, best, yeah. best of all, you document it by the person who's doing it and the person who would, who would take that over as well. So they kind of work hand in hand uh, on that. And I think that's, that's a really important thing that we lose sight of many times is, is the importance of getting... I'm bad at it too, you know? I mean, we all should step back and think about what we're doing and, and say, well, what if? I were not to be here, were somebody to be able to pick up and do what right. I'm doing without that interruption, without that, that disruption. So they are not a colossal waste of time. So they're not a colossal <laughs> waste of time. They're actually a very powerful tool, so, so check that out. Yeah. Check out the article again by Teresa Tarwater right down there and read up a little bit more on SOPs. Hey, you mentioned metrology, strangely enough. I did mention metrology, strangely <laughs> enough, because we have an excellent metrology-oriented tech corner for you here today. And, and this is one, sometimes we have guests come into the show uh, to do tech corners with us. But in this case, uh, Dirk, our intrepid, Managing, uh, I'm sorry, Editor-in-Chief, I almost said Managing Editor. Our intrepid Editor-in-Chief, Dirk Ducharme, is going to do this one on his own. It's from Marpos, it's the Nemo 8, the Red Crown 2, and the Horizontal Quick Set. So Dirk, take it away. Yep, thanks Mike. Well, like Mike said, we're going to look at a product from, from Marpos, and this is uh, a, a manual gauging system that's kind of intended for, uh, you know, production gauging, let's say, on the shop floor. And we're going to look at three components. Uh, we've got the, the Marpos Quick Check, and that's kind of this whole big fixture right here. Uh, we're going to take a look at the Red Crown 2 probes, that's the uh, LVDT probes that are going to be in the fixture, and we're going to look at the Nemo 8. <clears throat> let's start with the Nemo 8. So we come down here to look at the Nemo 8. Right now, <clears throat> this is just the display. So it's, a, it's a five, five and a half inch display, I believe, right here. And right now we're showing the output of four LVDT probes that happen to be plugged in the back. You can see as I move these probes, we're seeing them move there. So one of the interesting things about this right now is we're looking at the output of four probes simultaneously. Now, if, if we, uh, some of you are familiar with working with columns, very often uh, you'll have a column that might look at the output of a couple of probes, you know, a calculation, for instance, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, this allows you to, to look at more at one time than you, what you might do with a column, and I'll discuss that in a little bit when we get around to the actual uh, setup of the measurements that we're doing. Let's take a look at the back of the Nemo first. This Nemo is called the Nemo 8. This happens to be an 8 input, 8 USB input uh, gauge calibration, uh, I'm sorry, gauge computer. See, we've got four inputs already used up. There's another four inputs down here on the bottom, so eight USB inputs total. There's also a couple of Ethernet connectors so that you can send your data, um, you know, to a, uh, a computer on your LAN. There's also an RS-232 connector for outputting data serially, maybe to a, to a laptop or, or another computer. The Nemo is actually very intuitive to use, and I'm going to just show you how easy it is to set this up to program. Uh, actually, let me, let me back up here a little bit. Let's take a look at the probes real quick before we get into the programming. I think we have a picture of what one of the Red Crown 2 probes is. If we can throw that up on the screen. There we go. So you're seeing a picture here of the Red Crown 2. You can see on the right-hand side, that's the actual pencil probe. On the left-hand side is the USB end of it. And I want to talk about this a little bit. If we can come back to the Nemo. I'm going to unplug one of these. Okay, so this is the end of the probe itself. You can see that looks like just your regular standard USB connector, but inside this case, there's electronics. An LVDT probe is uh, an analog probe. You know, the output is analog. In order to go to something digital, which is what USB is, needs to be converted to digital. So inside this case is an A to D converter to convert the analog LVDT probe signal into a digital signal. 
Also in here is the electronics for correcting for small linear and sensitivity errors uh, that would be inherent in an LVDT probe. All LVDT probes have to be calibrated. That calibration information is stored within this connector as well. So obviously you take one of these probes, you could plug it into a laptop, you could plug it into a tower and start using it right away. We're just going to plug it right here into the Nemo. I'm going to get this where I can see it. Sorry about that, folks. There we go. And if we'll just show you how easy it is now to program this. Okay, so we're going to go into program mode. Notice on the, uh, the home page here, very simple menu. This is all touch screen. Measure programming settings and service. We're going to go into programming. We're going to look at a part that we've already programmed. I'm going to select that part program, go into edit, all touch screen, very easy to use, and we bring up the first set of characteristics that we're going to look at for the part we're going to measure. If we can switch over to the gauge cam here, I'll show you what we're going to measure. We have a part here we're going to look at, that's this part right here. We're going to measure the front diameter, the rear diameter, and the difference between the two diameters to give us taper. So I'll show you how that's done on the Nemo. Look at the Nemo, we've got three characteristics. The first characteristic is going to be front diameter, second is rear diameter, third is the difference between the two. I select that first characteristic, click edit, and that will bring up the data for that particular characteristic. And we can see all of this is, is editable, so we happen to have named this diameter front. We've told it that it is an external diameter. You see a little drop down menu there, we can select what kind of measurement this is going to be. Then there's the formula. What do we want to do with the data that we collect from uh, the set of probes? So we have a bunch of functions that we can select from, sine, cosine, tangent, a bunch of trig functions, some other functions as well. But what we're going to do here is we're simply going to take the first probe, subtract it from the second probe to give us our diameter. We can move down in our menu. We can set uh, the measurement units, uh, the precision, uh, what type of limits, bilateral in this case, what our nominal value is, what our upper and lower limit are, uh, uh, 0.1 millimeters in this case. And then we can move on to our next characteristic. And I will scroll up there. So now we're looking at the diameter in back. And again, external, uh, external diameter and the formula. And another thing I want to show you about the formulas, because I found this really interesting in this particular interface. Once you select the type of measurement that you're going to do, and remember in this case we're doing an external diameter, the amount of functions that are available to you are based on that context. These drop downs are context sensitive based on the type of measurement that you've selected. Now it is possible to select just a generic measurement and then you could have all of the functions available to you at one time. But if you're selecting particular types of measurement, this really is a shortcut to kind of ease uh, uh, ease the strain on the programmer, giving them only what's available for that particular type of measurement. So I thought that was a pretty nice feature. Let's just back out of this and let's go take some measurements. Okay, so we're going to go back to our home screen, click on measure, and now we're going to actually measure a part. Now, we've got our master in here right now, so we can switch to the gauge cam. This is a master part. This, uh, this system has been mastered to this part. This is also going to be our pretend good part, good production part. If I come to the Nemo, I say start, we'll see on the Nemo that our part, as we would expect, since this is the master, is all within tolerance. Notice we've got all green bars right there. If we were measuring a production part, we would say, hey, this is a good part. So let's drop a bad part in here. So I'm going to take a part that is obviously not the same part. We're going to drop it in there. Now if we go back to the Nemo, and look at it, you can see we've got two reds, we've got a green, and in fact, I'm going to flip this part over because there's something else I want to show you. It's going to take a slightly different measurement. Now we've got two reds and a yellow. This can be configured to look at, um, this can be configured to be just a straight go, no go, where you get reds or greens, or you can have it show, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, approach lights, and that would be the yellow. So if you want to look, are, am I approaching a limit? That can be programmed in too, and in this case we look at the Nemo, that shows up as a, as a yellow. So sometimes that's valuable for the operator, rather than just a straight go, no go, you've passed, you failed, it's nice to know sometimes when you're approaching a limit, and so we have that approach light built in there. Now as they're taking the data, once they've dropped their part in there, they've hit start, start 
they now hit stop, that data is captured and stored. Now the operator can now take this part off, put another part on, say start, that takes the data, stop, it captures that data, stores it, they could take another part, I'll put a good part in this time, they capture, they say start, they capture the data, they say stop, the data is stored. So the value here is that um, sometimes you want your production operator just to quickly go through parts, you know, pass, fail, pass, fail, whatever. But you want that data to be stored because you're going to need to go back or somebody's going to need to go back and look at trend data because that trend data, all that data stored over time on a particular type of part is valuable. All that data is stored. It can be offloaded via sticking a USB memory stick in. It can be sent over the, uh, the uh, uh, a local area network via the Ethernet connection. It can be downloaded over the RS-232. All of those outputs are available uh, from the NEMO. Now let's take a look at the fixture itself. If we can go to the gauge here. Okay, this is uh, a horizontal uh, quick set. They also make this as a vertical quick set and also a chuck quick, uh, quick set. The chuck quick set is for chucked parts. The vertical quick set, which is kind of a vertical orientation of this, is for uh, Parts, uh, uh, parts, between, uh, parts between centers. But what we've got right here is the horizontal one. This is about 14 inches wide. Uh, it could be 30 inches wide, 3 feet wide, doesn't matter. It's the size of the centerpiece. It's what you order. Let's look at these parts in here. These are standard parts, now fixturing parts. So imagine you have a, a base, a very rugged base that you're working for, working with, with a cross member. You've got these um, uh, V-blocks to hold your part, and then you've got these transmission blocks which actually hold the probe, the Red Crown 2 probes, which are going to do your measurement for you. Now notice that uh, the one thing that's interesting about these probes, here is actually, I'm not sure we can see it, there is actually the tip of your probe. The probe does not come in contact with the actual part itself. The probe is in contact with a transmission lever which then makes uh, contact with the part. The reason for that is when you put a part in, you don't want that part rubbing across the top of your probe and side loading it because over time that's going to damage the probe. This way it's dropping down against a rugged, uh, a rugged little lever here which, which uh, transmits that movement to the probe. The probe is protected. Sure, the, uh, the, the tip uh, the little the business end tip of this transmission uh, can wear out, but that's much less uh, to ex um, uh, much less cost to uh, replace than would be replacing a probe. And obviously, also uh, these have over travel built into them, so you can't overextend uh, you can't overextend your probe. There's actually limits that can be set on these transmission levers to prevent over travel. So all of this makes for a very rugged and flexible fixturing system. And that's really what you want. A lot of you have to deal with um, custom fixtures that you have to store a, a bunch of fixtures, one fixture for each type of part. This is very easy to take these components, which are off-the-shelf components, move them back and forth on the rail, put them wherever you need them to very quickly set up a fixture to measure a part so much better than using like a, a custom fixturing, uh, which is, 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 is a cost and also a storage issue. So once again, uh, this is a manual gauging system from Marpos. We looked at the quick set, that's the fixture. We looked at the Red Crown to LVDT USB probe, and of course we looked at the NEMO uh, uh, 8 USB input gauging computer. All of this from MARPOS, and once again thanks to the folks at MARPOS for sending this along to us. Back to you, Mike. All right, thank you, Dirk. And yes, there it is from Marpos, the NEMO 8, the Red Crown 2, and the horizontal quick set. Uh, great, uh, great product there from MARPOS, Dirk. Yep. And uh, very well done, Dirk, I think. I, I, you, you always like doing those. They're fun. That yeah. was a lot to cover on that. Lots to cover on that. <laughs> lot to cover on that. Well, thank you. Thank you again to Marpos for giving that to us. And, and that is our show for the week. And uh, before we go, we'd like to offer one more thank you to today's sponsor, 360 Performance Circle, a new kind of training company with handsomely produced streaming video content covering lean, quality, and best practices within test and measurement. 360 Performance Circle is your destination point for the best training on the web. For more information, check out the banner ad just below or just to the right of this video player screen. That's right. Well, thank you all for joining us uh, once again, and we will hope that you join us again next week. Uh, thanks to Marpos again for sending us yep. their, their system, um, that was, uh, and also spending a lot of time with me on the phone to actually uh, make, make it sound like maybe I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> so, 
Thanks to you guys, and thanks to all of you for joining us, and we will see you again next week. That's right. Have a great weekend. So long. Bye.